there was a decision made to intentionally engage in conduct that would hurt people if the market broke a certain way, but could help them and could cover up the hole in their balance sheet if the market broke another way. One flip of the coin leads to jail. The other leads to more opulence, wealth, and no one knowing the wiser. And Bankman Fried made a choice. That's a deliberate choice. It's a cold, calculated choice. It's a criminal choice. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Unchained, your no-hype resource for all things crypto. I'm your host, Laura Shin, author of The Cryptopians. I started covering crypto eight years ago, and as the senior editor at Forbes, was the first mainstream media reporter to cover cryptocurrency full-time. This is the March 29th, 2024 episode of Unchained. Polkadot is the original and leading layer zero blockchain with over 2,000 plus developers. And the Polkadot 2.0 upgrade will be a massive accelerator for the ecosystem. Join the community at polkadot.network slash ecosystem slash community. With iTrust Capital, you can buy and sell crypto in a tax advantage retirement account. Enjoy significant tax advantages, 24 seven access, and the industry's lowest fees. Today's guest is Sam Enzer, partner at Cahill, Gordon & Rindell. Welcome, Sam. Hi, Laura. Thanks for having me on again. We're recording a few hours after Judge Lewis Kaplan sentenced Sam Bankman free to 25 years in prison and $11 billion in forfeiture. You followed the trial closely, in part because you gave us fantastic regular updates on every aspect of the trial. What's your reaction to this sentence? I had predicted, I think on this show and others, that Sam Bankman Fried would get a sentence somewhere between 20 and 30 years. And that is, in fact, what Judge Kaplan did. He sentenced Sam Bankman Fried to 25 years in prison, $11 billion in forfeiture. And I, I think that that strikes a balance that I think is fair, reasonable, and appropriate. It strikes a balance because this was a, a fraud of epic proportions. And Sam Bankman Fried did just about everything you can do to inflame the fire rather than putting it out by not accepting responsibility, tampering with witnesses, destroying evidence, proceeding to trial, perjuring himself on the witness stand, and then not really accepting responsibility, giving a mealy-mouthed, what, what my wife calls a husband's apology, an apology where you <laughs> say, I'm sorry you feel bad about what I did. I'm sorry mm -hmm. uh, that mistakes were made as opposed to I'm sorry that I did something wrong. Here is what I did wrong. I apologize to you for that and it will never happen again. There's a di difference. I've learned it after over a decade of marriage and his apology was not full remorse. It wasn't full acceptance of responsibility. All of these factors are aggravating and I think justify a sentence north of 20 years. But on the other hand, you have mitigating circumstances. Number one, Bankman Fried was very young. Relatively speaking, this is not Bernard Madoff. He's not a guy who committed a Ponzi fraud for decades and only eventually got caught late in his life. There were exit ramps, but the number of exit ramps from the fraud are much smaller than what Bernard Madoff had, and that warrants something less. This was his first crime, Bankman Freed, and, and possibly, I mean, likely his only crime in his life. This was a, a weird confluence of events, a perfect storm in terms of a crypto bull run, the internet being a way to convey solicitations of deposits. There were a variety of things that came together to make a fraud of this nature even possible. So when you put it all into them, and, and on, Another important factor, the government sought a sentence of 40 to 50 years. In doing that, they are implicitly acknowledging that a life sentence is not appropriate because here the maximum sentence was north of 100 years, the guidelines were stratospheric, and the government could have said max this guy out, put him away for as long as possible. They did not do that. And as soon as they did that, you, you are now in a territory, in a terrain where the defense is saying, yeah, it's got to be prison time, but it should be six and a half. The government's saying he's got to do more than that, it should be 40 to 50. If you look at the midpoint, 25 is roughly in, in the middle. And so it's, it's almost like a, a reasonable balancing of these 
various interests, Judge Kaplan is basically saying that as bad as this was, and as important as it is that it be a long sentence to deter others and send the right message, we also have to acknowledge as a society that prison is supposed to rehabilitate, except in rare cases. We're, we're supposed to acknowledge that somebody is capable of being redeemed, and we have to give them some light at the end of the tunnel, both to incentivize them to really take that rehabilitation work seriously, and um, so that if they do get out, hopefully at an age when they've learned something, um, there is some life there at the end of the road for, for them to um, come back into society. And then what is it about the $11 billion in forfeiture? Because presumably SPF will never earn that. I mean, most people don't earn that amount in their lifetime. So, you know, what exactly does that mean? And like, how does it get paid back and to who? Yeah. So forfeiture, the government has the power to forfeit, uh, to seize and forfeit to the government coffers, to the U.S. Treasury, um, any proceeds of a fraud. So if there's any property in the world that Sam Bankman-Fried arguably owns, which could be traceable to the fraud, or if he doesn't have enough assets, if there are substitute assets that are clean assets, but necessary to satisfy that amount, that $11 billion, the government can recover them. And what the government has said here is they're going to, rather than taking the money and using it for government uh, budget, they are going to remit the funds to victims. There is a program the Department of Justice has. The um, Attorney General has discretion through the Chief of the Money Laundering and Asset Recovery Section in Maine Justice to set up a claims process where if you're a victim of a fraud, you put a claim in, somebody, whether it's the Chief of the Money Laundering and Asset Recovery Section or a designated claim administrator will receive the claims, will determine whether they are valid claims, whether they are the amount is right, and if there are funds that have been seized, they will be sent back to victims to compensate victims. Whether there is a recovery here, there are assets out there, right? We, we In the bankruptcy estate, there's money. Bankman Freed may have properties that have not been seized yet. I'm not sure whether the government expects to seize funds, but if there are funds to get, they could use the authority of the forfeiture judgment to go recover the funds and try to repay them to victims. And just to understand, you said if the property is in his name, I think, you know, at least from the trial, a decent amount of it was purchased with FTX customer money. So if it's in his name, is that considered his or is it part of the FTX estate? It's a great question. Um, so first of all, I think there are some very interesting legal issues about whether the government, if they really wanted to, could go in and f seize money that is technically part of the bankruptcy estate. This was an issue that arose back in the in the Madoff days. Th there were circumstances, but I, I don't think the government would do that. Uh, I think that the government would probably say that whatever assets have been determined by the bankruptcy court to be part of the FTX bankruptcy estate, they're going to leave that there and that will be um, distributed through the process of the, administered by the bankruptcy court. And so really what we have to talk about then is, are there assets that are not company assets, but that belong to him? And that can be very broad, okay? It doesn't have to be in his name. If he's the de facto owner, but he put it in somebody else's name, let's say he used fraud proceeds to buy a Ferrari and gave the Ferrari to his brother. If the government could prove that, they could seize that Ferrari, even if the Ferrari is in the brother's name, um, as just a, just an example. And you know, maybe that's a bad example for SBF. I think he's more of a Toyota guy uh, or a Hyundai guy. Well, he has his thirty-five million dollar apartment. <laughs> uh, the apartment would be a good example if if that's in his name, um, and if it's still out there, they could seize it, sell it, and use the proceeds to compensate victims. And but just to understand, so. I think the FTX estate is also trying to compensate victims, but this would be some kind of parallel process that, that the U.S. government. Oh, interesting. 
yeah, the the FTX estate can only recover the property of the debtors, which are the FTX entities listed in the Chapter 11 petition. They can't take anybody's money, right? And there is a distinction between a company that files for Chapter 11 bankruptcy and the individual executives who work at that company. While we think of FTX and SBF as one because he created the company and he was the CEO, they are legally distinct. Um, and there are assets that are owned by the entities. And there are a separate category of assets that he personally possessed, owned, controlled. Okay. And then just last question, like he'll be roughly in his fifties when he gets out. So if he earns any money after that, then does some percentage of that automatically have to go to the government for this $11 billion forfeiture? The forfeiture judgment, if it's, if it's not satisfied, will continue to hang over him. And like any debt, the government can collect. it. Oh, okay. Um, and where do you think he'll go to prison and how will that be decided? Designations for prison are decided by the U.S. Bureau of Prisons. The court does not have the power to decide where an inmate goes. Uh, they can make a recommendation, but they cannot control it. Uh, so the Bureau of Prisons will do a calculation. I expect they'll send him to um, some place that is not maximum security because he is a nonviolent white-collar criminal. You know, if you've seen the movie... Um, Office Space, one of the greatest movies of all time. I'm not a big movie person, so most movies I have not seen. <laughs> uh, you should see Office Space, and it they, they talk about minimum security white-collar resorts. I don't really think there is such a thing, but I, I do think he's going to go to a circumstance that's not as bad as going to a max security with violent criminals. And when do you think it'll be decided? Uh, the Bureau of Prisons usually does that within a few months of the sentencing. And then since he's been in jail since last summer, does the 25-year clock start once he enters that prison or does that time somehow get included? He gets credit for all the time he's been in custody. So um, the Bureau of Prisons, in a uh, they have an office in Grand Prairie, Texas, that does a calculation of how much time you've earned. And they will do. They will run a calculation of how much time he's earned from the date of his incarceration. Oh, so in a way, he's already served like nine-ish months or something like that. Seven months. Okay, got it. All right. So in a moment, we're going to talk a little bit more about um, SPF's future. But first, a quick word from the sponsors who make this show possible. Polkadot is the original and largest layer zero blockchain with over two thousand plus developers. The anticipated Polkadot 2.0 upgrade will be a massive accelerator for the ecosystem, upgrading the infrastructure with eight times higher transaction throughput and twice as fast block times, tailored core time for the needs of every protocol, trustless bridges to multiple chains, and revised tokenomics with a token burn to reduce inflation. Perfect for GameFi and DeFi to build, grow, and scale. Get your Web3 ideas to market fast. Think big, build bigger with Polkadot. Join the community at polkadot.network slash ecosystem slash community. Back to my conversation with Sam. And so we often hear about prisoners being uh, eligible for parole. When would SBF be eligible? There is no parole in the federal system. Uh, that is not allowed in, in, in the federal system. In state prisons, many states have a parole that the federal system used to. They abolished it. So if you get prison time, you do the time. There is no parole release. The exception to that, there are a few things. Number one, um, if you behave well in prison, you get good time credit. So the Bureau of Prisons will give you a percentage off of your, effectively, they're giving you credit against the sentence for being a good inmate. And that, you know, probably will chop five to 10-ish percent off of the actual amount of prison time. That's number one. Number two, there are programs in prison. So for example, if you, there's a program called RDAP. If you're, if you have a drug abuse problem and you go to rehab, you can do the RDAP program if you're eligible. And that can be a basis to get credit. 
uh, and he maybe he'll argue that he is eligible because he abused Adderall or something like that um, as a means of getting more credit. In addition, many inmates in the advent of the pandemic, uh, many inmates made motions for what's called compassionate release. The federal rules of criminal procedure and uh, have been expanded and the statutes have been expanded to allow someone in prison, if they can justify a showing of compassionate release, to ask a court after sentencing to reduce the sentence. Indeed, um, I think Sam Bankman frieds sentence was 20, is 25 years. I believe that's it, it, the same as what Bernard Ebers, the CEO of WorldCom, got for the WorldCom fraud. Ebers actually applied a few years ago for a uh, retrospective reduction of his sentence under the compassionate release statute. And so that might be a pathway. I mean, it, it would be way too soon for him to do that, but it is something he could pursue, let's say, in five years, in 10 years, in 15 years, and say, look, I've been a good inmate. Judge, please reduce the sentence. And would it then go to Kaplan or a different judge? If Kaplan is still around, it'll go to him. I see. While SBF is serving his sentence, which he's doing now, I expect he's going to appeal the conviction and sentence. Indeed, he said, his lawyer said he was going to today in court, that, that that was their intention, and I'm not surprised by that. And so I'm sure he will try to attack the conviction and the sentence on a direct appeal. If he loses the direct appeal, there are methods of doing a post-conviction challenge to a conviction, including what's called a writ of habeas corpus. Um, so there are these, there's a whole world of schemes and statutes that inmates sometimes use to try to challenge their conviction. It's very, very difficult. It's very unlikely to prevail in a direct appeal. It's even less likely to prevail in a post-conviction collateral attack on a conviction. But I expect he will pursue all of these avenues. And a direct appeal is what? Uh, direct appeal is SBF files a notice of appeal with the Intermediate Court of Appeals called the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, so in our system, we have a trial court, which is Judge Kaplan. There's an intermediate appellate court, which is a circuit court. And each, there are several, there are several circuits in our country. The Second Circuit covers New York, Vermont, uh, a few other states. Um, so you, you apply to the Second Circuit, you appeal to them. They make a decision. And you can then ask for the U.S. Supreme Court to hear the case. It's very rare that they would do that. They typically will only hear a case if there is a conflict between multiple circuits on a point of law. So they take a case on that issue to resolve the conflict. So more or less what you're really looking at is we've got a judgment now impose or there will be a final judgment imposing sentence and memorializing the conviction against SBF. He will, I am sure, file a notice of appeal with the Second Circuit indicating that he intends to challenge the conviction and sentence. That opens an appellate case, a docket number is assigned, a briefing schedule is set. SBF will file an appeal, a brief, explaining why he thinks his conviction should be overturned I am sure he'll argue he got an unfair trial and that there were errors in the trial process. Um, and I think he'll probably also challenge his sentence. He'll say, even if the conviction was appropriate, the sentence was unlawful. And, and at a minimum, the sentence should be revisited. The government will have an opportunity to oppose. SBF will have an opportunity to submit a reply brief in support of his appeal. The circuit will hear argument, oral argument, before a panel of three judges. And then they render a decision. That process can take a year, two years, three years, can take quite some time. And I don't think SBF is going to prevail in an appeal, but he certainly will pursue. And so if that takes two or three years, um, basically, we could be looking at a situation where the, if the clock started last summer, then by the time he actually enters prison, he'll have actually served let's say like three years of his sentence, something like that. Yeah. And he will enter the, the Bureau of Prisons 
is going to conduct itself as though this is a final judgment. So he will go to prison. He will be designated. He will go to a prison um, and he will be serving his sentence while the appeal plays out. Okay. Oh, I see. Got it. And um, so earlier when we talked about the good behavior, you said at most 10%. So basically um, that would be two and a half years off of the 25 and then he'll start having already served a bit. So um, potentially once the appeal process is over, it might end up being like 20 once, once it's all kind of the legal process is done. Well, I wanted to ask about um, an anecdote that was told today, which is that Sam has been teaching the other inmates at Metropolitan Detention Center. I think it was something about like helping them get their degrees, like maybe high school degrees. Um, is that the kind of thing that constitutes good behavior? Or what, what are examples of good behavior that would get him less time? Um, I think good behavior is actually much easier than that. It would inc- for, for good time credit, it's kind of just don't make trouble. Um, this behavior of teaching other inmates is, is great. I applaud him for doing that. And I think that's the kind of thing that you would ask a court to consider on a compassionate release application. Oh, Okay. And the docket says that he'll serve three years supervised after his release. Talk about that. What does that mean? So it's common in our system that we have a period of supervised release following a prison term. Uh, And so what that means is when the day comes, assuming Sam Bank and Freed serves his time uh, and survives, he'll be released. And then a probation officer will be assigned to supervise him and ensure that he complies with the conditions of his supervised release for a period of time. Part of that, and I think he was sentenced to three years of supervised release, which is very common. So part of that is actually rehabilitative. Um, The probation department has resources. They can connect you with job placement programs, therapists, and they have a budget to do that. And so there is a component of it that is helpful as a resource for somebody getting out. But part of it is also to make sure that they follow the rules and aren't going to reoffend. And if they do, then the probation officer can submit a violation report, can accuse the person of violating their conditions of release. And the judge can then make a determination about whether they in fact violated and if so, punish them, including by sending them back to prison. And so in Sam's case, like, what's an example of something that would violate, like, what are typical conditions for a prisoner like him? No drug use, um, no commission of new crimes. So if he committed a financial fraud, he got out and committed a financial fraud, he'd go right back in. Okay. So now let's talk a little bit about what happened during the sentencing today. Uh, First of all, SPF spoke for a little bit. Um, Basically, it actually, I'll just recap this for listeners. It started with one of the FTX creditors giving a speech about um, how he and other creditors have been affected. Um, It ended up veering a little bit more into criticism of the FTX bankruptcy estate. And eventually Judge Kaplan just said, look, this is things you should take up with the bankruptcy estate. It's not appropriate for this hearing, which concerns, you know, what Mr. Bankman Fried's sentence should be. Um, And then after that, the lawyer representing a class action lawsuit, I guess, of FTX creditors spoke about how Sam and the other insiders have been very helpful to them. And he wanted the judge to take that into account. But I felt like a lot of this was theater because I thought, I'm sure Judge Kaplan has already decided. I don't know how much these speeches on the day of are affecting things. And then Mark Casey, his new lawyer, uh, gave, yeah, I guess, like an argument for, for their um, recommendation of six years. Um, he was definitely better than Mark Cohen, I have to say. Um, Mark Cohen has a a much sleepier demeanor. It's just the word that I kept writing in my notebook every time he spoke. I was like very sleepy delivery. Um, Mark Mukasey, you know, just has a more normal delivery and cadence, um, you know, very clear. Honestly, from his speech, I wrote in my notebook at the end, you know, very compelling. I could feel this sort of like, just emotional vibration in the room of like everybody kind of feeling like, okay, yeah, Sam's a human, you know, this is kind of a big deal of what he's facing here. 
Um, however, um, I don't remember. Well, the, the main thing is that he said something like, Sam ha- d- does not have malice in his heart, but he had math in his head. And those words came back to haunt him later. Um, similarly, right after this, Sam spoke. And when he spoke, um, first of all, when he walked in the courtroom, you know, he had his hands in handcuffs and he was dressed in, you know, this ratty old khaki-ish shirt. And yeah, and um, you could hear chains when he was walking. And I mean, he he kind of smiled at the courtroom, I think, sort of to put on a brave face. But, you know, last we saw him, you know, he was wearing suits and stuff for the trial. So this was definitely a, a change. Um, however, one thing is, you know, when he spoke... Everything was sort of as you expect, like expressing uh, kind of concern for the creditors and how they're facing these troubles. But then he um, talked about the liquidity crisis that FTX faced in November of 2022. And the second he said those words, I was like, judge is not going to like this. And indeed, yeah, um, it went on in that vein um, for a little bit. And I, I left the speech feeling like, oh, he, he didn't do himself any favors there. Because this goes back to, you know, what you mentioned about um, he perjured himself. And I felt like he's continuing with with that storyline. But anyway, um, I, I might have messed up the order. At some point, Nicholas Rose spoke. Um, I think it was actually maybe before SPF, I forget. But um, as usual, he gave a very clear and... Um, you know, very loud, slow delivery, like just every word landing. He called out those phrases like liquidity crisis. So he must have spoken after SPF and, you know, made made the case for why they were recommending 40 to 50 years. Um, yeah. And then, then Judge Kaplan spoke. And so here's actually what my question is. I know it's a very long recap, but I wanted people to kind of hear this sort of blow by blow. So Judge Kaplan, he talked quite a bit about this concept of expected value. And he, at least to my mind, he seemed to imply that this philosophy was what led SPF to commit these crimes. For instance, he called out different conversations that Caroline Ellison had with Sam about expected value and about how willing he was to take risks. Uh, In one of the conversations, he said that he was risk neutral and that he would flip a coin if he knew that tails, it would come up with the world being destroyed, but heads, the world would be twice as good. You know, he talked about Sam's ambitions to be influential, especially politically. He talked about how Sam uh, committed one of the biggest bribes in U.S. history. And then he basically talked about um, how this interest in sort of expected value, which, you know, Judge Kaplan said, some people would call cost benefit analysis. Um, but he implied like it's a kind of form of gambling in a way. Like, um, and he said this was a leitmotif of the case. It's his, it's in his nature. Um, so anyway, I was just curious for your thoughts on how he really zoomed in on that uh, aspect, the expected value part of, you know, Sam's motivation. Judge Kaplan is a brilliant judge and he's got a strong moral compass. And unfortunately for Sam Bankman Freed, he handled this case in a manner that exposed Judge Kaplan to weeks of testimony about the the the, con, the conduct, the crime. So Judge Kaplan saw, sat through, and and this is why many defense lawyers, if if a client is guilty, many defense lawyers will counsel their client that they should bite the bullet and plead guilty and accept responsibility because if it is inevitable that you're going to be convicted. It is better to accept responsibility and not expose the court to weeks of gory testimony about the nature of the crime. So in the trial, the motif was this theme about Sam bankman fried being utilitarian, having a utilitarian philosophy, having an approach that basically says, I can break an egg if it makes an omelet. And applying that here, it sort of takes away all the defense arguments about how, oh, this is just mismanagement and a liquidity crisis got away from us. No, this was a decision. 
there was a decision made to intentionally engage in conduct that would hurt people if the market broke a certain way, but could help them and could cover up the hole in their balance sheet if the market broke another way. One, one flip of the coin leads to jail. The other leads to more opulence, wealth, and no one knowing the wiser. And Bankman Fried made a choice. That's a deliberate choice. It's a cold, calculated choice. It's a criminal choice. As opposed to, oh, I'm just a college kid and oh my God, things are getting away from me and I'm mismanaging and my flip-flops are, oh my God, and oh, I, I lost $8 billion, right? This is the, the combating themes that are being presented. Taking the undisputed facts and putting a gloss on them. And the defense wants to, to paint a gloss of a mistake, perhaps an innocent mistake, perhaps a negligent mistake, but not a criminal mistake. And the government paints a story of no, this was a th this was theft, deliberate, cold, and calculated, and we know where Judge Kaplan landed on it. He he saw it and called it the way he saw it, as a deliberate, calculated bet, a criminal bet, and Bankman Fried lost the bet and has to suffer the consequences for that. At this point, what happens now for the co-conspirators, Caroline Ellison, Nishad Singh, and Gary Wong? When will they be sentenced and what are you expecting on that score? Uh, I would expect them to be sentenced. Now, now that Bankman Freed has been sentenced, their sentencings will follow. Um, they will argue that they assisted in bringing Sam Bankman Freed to justice and that the sentence uh, handed down to Sam Bankman Freed, which was important, that they were part of achieving it and necessary to achieve it and deserve leniency for it. Um, it would not su surprise me at, at all if all of them get no prison time. I think that they have demonstrated, for, first of all, separate and apart from whether they deserve no time, Judge Kaplan wants to, just as you want to punish the bad guy to deter others from committing bad crimes, you want to incentivize and encourage cooperation because the government needs witnesses to make cases. You can't get a guy like Sam Bankman Freed without a human narrator to tell the jury, this is what it all means. This is what happens. I spoke to him. He knew exactly what was up. He told me to change this. He told me to change this, uh, th this spreadsheet that we were going to give to one of our lenders to be the most misleading scenario, right? It's hard to do that without a human witness. Judge Kaplan knows this. And so the, the, to talk about the coin metaphor, the flip side of the deterrence coin is the incentive coin, the carrot. We've got to give a carrot to cooperators. Uh, and for that reason, I would expect very lenient sentences for the cooperators and perhaps sentences that do not involve prison time. So it feels like we're kind of closing this um, very long chapter in crypto because in a way, all of that started really in May of 2022 um, with Terra Luna. Um, so, you know, at this point, what would you say this whole trial and, and this sentence means for crypto generally? I think this is the closing of a dark chapter and the opening of a new one. I think SBF represents the Wild West cowboy ethos of crypto of early days. Jubilance and a lack of diligence positioning a fraudster, a huckster to take advantage of folks. But the technology itself has transformative promise for society. And there are so many good actors with good intentions, entrepreneurs, developers, innovators, who are trying to take this technology and use it for, for the good of themselves, for the good of our country, for the good of our society. Uh, and they need a runway to do that. And to do that, we got to get rid of the bad actors. SBF was prosecuted. This demonstrates that there are guardrails against bad actors, that it can be handled by our system, notwithstanding that it's on the blockchain instead of on Wall Street. And I think it's important to look forward now and say, all right, we've got a new bull market. Hopefully we've learned something from the mistakes of the last bull run. And 
maybe we can embrace some of the consumer protection that we need to restore confidence and let this technology and its promise better everyone. All right. Well, thank you so much, Sam, for coming on Unchained. Thanks for having me. Don't forget, next up is the weekly news recap today presented by Unchained contributor Megan Christensen. Stick around for This Week in Crypto after this short break. Did you know you can buy and sell crypto with tax benefits in an individual retirement account? iTrust Capital makes this possible. But what does this mean? When you buy crypto outside an IRA, like on an exchange, you face taxes on gains. But in an IRA, like a Roth IRA, gains can be tax-free. iTrust Capital also has some of the lowest fees in the industry and 24-7 accessibility. Start now and maximize your retirement savings with iTrust Capital. Thanks for tuning in to the Weekly News Recap. Today, we're diving into Coinbase's legal tussle with the SEC. Munchable's remarkable recovery of stolen Ethereum, the unfolding trial of Tornado Cash's developer, a Binance executive's unexpected escape amid legal troubles, KuCoin's regulatory challenges from both the CFTC and DOJ, BlackRock's continued optimism for an Ethereum ETF, and Ripple's looming battle over a potential billion-dollar SEC fine. This recap was written by Juan Aronovich and edited by Nelson Wang. I'm Megan Christensen. Let's begin. A Manhattan federal court has ruled against crypto exchange Coinbase, allowing the SEC's lawsuit, which alleges unregistered sales of securities by the cryptocurrency exchange, to proceed to trial. This decision marks a significant victory for the SEC and could have wide implications for the crypto industry. The lawsuit, filed in June, accuses Coinbase of operating as an unregistered broker and exchange. The SEC is seeking to permanently stop the company from continuing such activities. Judge Catherine Polk Thela, in her ruling, stated that the crypto label doesn't change the nature of the transactions, which fit within the long-standing legal framework for identifying securities. Despite the court's decision, it did agree to dismiss part of the SEC's complaint pertaining to Coinbase's wallet application, stating it did not act as an unregistered broker in this instance. Following the news, Coinbase's shares dropped around 2.5%. The company's chief legal officer, Paul Graywall, responded on Twitter by saying, quote, we were prepared for this, end quote. Also this week, Coinbase announced its intention to significantly increase the portion of its customer and corporate USDC balances stored on base, its Ethereum Layer 2 network. This shift aims to leverage the benefits of blockchain technology including enhanced security, reduced fees, and faster settlement times for its users. Currently, Coinbase holds $256 million in USDC, with a significant portion already on BASE. Coinbase's initiative comes at a time when BASE has demonstrated significant growth, achieving a total value locked, TVL, of over $1 billion, with substantial activity spikes following Ethereum's recent Denkin upgrade. In a remarkable turnaround, the Web3 gaming platform Munchables successfully reclaimed $62.5 million worth of Ethereum lost in a security exploit on Wednesday. The funds were returned by a developer who was linked to the theft, affirming the integrity of the platform's security measures. Munchables, which operates on the Ethereum Layer 2 network blast, encountered the security breach when unauthorized transactions were traced back to an internal team member, sparking concerns of a potential inside job. Following intensive investigations led by blockchain detective Zach XBT, speculations arose about the exploiter's connections to North Korea hackers, although conclusive evidence has not been found. The breach was enabled by smart contract permissions that allowed the developer to execute fund transfers, a vulnerability that was exploited to siphon 17,413 ETH from the platform. In a statement on X, Munchables reassured its users, declaring that, quote, all user funds are safe, end quote and also announced the unconditional return of the stolen assets to a multi-sig wallet, safeguarding the platform's liquidity. The community's response has been overwhelmingly positive, with many applauding the swift action taken to secure the return of the funds without resorting to controversial measures such as rolling back the blockchain. Dutch prosecutors recommended a 64-month jail sentence for Alexei Pertsev, the developer behind Tornado Cash, for alleged involvement in laundering $1.2 billion through the cryptocurrency mixing service. Pertsev's trial, which could set a precedent for the legal treatment of open source project developers, took place over two days, with a verdict expected on May 14th. 
arrested in August 2022 following Tornado Cash's blacklisting by the U.S. Treasury for its alleged connection to North Korean hackers, Persev's case highlights the ongoing debate over the role of privacy tools in the crypto ecosystem and their legal implications. In a turn of events that has captured international attention, Binance, the world's largest cryptocurrency exchange, finds itself embroiled in controversy in Nigeria. Nigerian authorities have levied four counts of tax evasion against Binance, including allegations of non-payment of value-added tax, commonly known as VAD, and company income tax, failure to submit tax returns, and aiding customers in tax evasion. Alongside these charges, two of Binance's senior executives, U.S. citizen Tigran Gambarian and British Kenyan citizen Nadim Anjarala, were detained in Nigeria. In a dramatic development, reports emerged that Nadim Anjarala had managed to escape from custody in Abuja, Nigeria's capital. This escape coincides with Nigerian authorities intensifying their legal actions against Binance by filing new tax charges. The Nigerian Federal Inland Revenue Service announced these charges amid ongoing tensions between the Nigerian government and Binance. Binance responded to the situation by stating, quote, We are made aware that Nadim is no longer in Nigerian custody. Our primary focus remains on the safety of our employees, and we are working collaboratively with the Nigerian authorities to quickly resolve this issue. End quote. In a concerted effort to enforce regulatory compliance, the CFTC and the DOJ simultaneously targeted KuCoin with serious allegations. The CFTC's complaint against the exchange encompasses charges of illegal dealings in off-exchange commodity futures transactions, including major cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Ether, and Litecoin, without the necessary registration and adherence to regulatory standards. This regulatory action emphasized the requirement for KuCoin to align with all applicable regulations and highlights Ether and Litecoin as commodities within the scope of the CFTC's authority. Parallel to the CFTC's legal action, the DOJ accused KuCoin and its founders of anti-money laundering violations, specifically criticizing the exchange's lack of an effective anti-money laundering program and adequate know-your-customer procedures. These charges allege that KuCoin facilitated the transmission of over $4 billion dollars and suspicious and criminal funds. Following these allegations, KuCoin experienced a notable withdrawal of assets, with 273 million leaving the platform as users reacted to the potential implications of these legal challenges. Larry Fink, CEO of BlackRock, the world's leading asset management firm, maintains a positive outlook on the potential for an Ethereum ETF, even amid speculation that the SEC might classify ETH as a security. This optimism follows a successful launch and significant growth of BlackRock's Bitcoin ETF and its Ethereum-based tokenized fund, indicating a strong start in the cryptocurrency-based fund market, and nearly 245 million minted in Ethereum-based bill tokens. BlackRock is positioning itself as a major player in the digital asset space. Think's confidence suggests a belief that the regulatory designation of Ethereum will not hinder the approval and success of a potential Ether ETF. The SEC proposed a hefty fine against Ripple Labs, totaling almost $2 billion, marking a significant moment in the regulators' ongoing enforcement actions against the cryptocurrency industry. The SEC's filing in a New York court asked Judge Annalisa Torres to enforce the fine, emphasizing the need to deter Ripple and others from future violations related to unregistered security sales. The fine comprises $876 million in disgorgement, $198 million in prejudgment interest, and an additional $876 million in civil penalties related to Ripple's direct sales of XRP tokens to institutional investors. The SEC argues that these sales, amounting to nearly $1 billion, were conducted without necessary registrations, undermining the financial market's legal structure. Ripple, for its part, has signaled its intention to vigorously contest the SEC's claims. The company's executives have criticized the SEC's approach, accusing the regulator of misleading and punitive tactics. Ripple's response to the proposed judgment is anticipated by April 22nd. Meanwhile, House Republicans urge the SEC to provide clarity on whether Ether is a security before Prometheum can custody it, warning of market disruption if classified as such. FTX's bankruptcy estate is set to sell two-thirds of its stake in the AI startup Anthropic for $884 million, a significant transaction that values the stake at more than twice the acquisition cost by Sam Bankman-Fried in 2021. 
The deal involves various institutional buyers, including Jane Street and Fidelity Managed Funds, underscoring the high interest in Anthropic's potential. The move is part of the estate's effort to maximize returns for creditors from FTX's assets. Ethereum's gas fees for transactions involving blobs have surged exponentially following the introduction of a new protocol named Etherscriptions just weeks after the Dankun upgrade was implemented to lower costs. The blob scriptions feature allows users to inscribe data on blobs, leading to a dramatic increase in the blob base fee to 14,499,530 way. Despite contrast with the intended effect of the upgrade, which was designed to make transactions cheaper by enabling rollups to store data temporarily in blobs rather than permanently in call data. And that's all. Thanks so much for joining us today. If you enjoyed this recap, go to unchainedcrypto.substack.com. That is unchainedcrypto.substack.com and sign up for our free newsletter so that you can stay up to date with the latest in crypto. Unchained is produced by Laura Shin with help from Nelson Wang, Matt Pilchard, Juan Aronovich, Megan Gavis, Shashank, and Margaret Korea. Thanks so much for listening. Unchained is now a part of the Coindesk Podcast Network. For the latest in digital assets, check out Markets Daily, five days a week, with host Noel Atchison. Follow the Coindesk Podcast Network for some of the best shows in crypto.